So. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth Disability Research and Education in Academic Medicine, or DREAM, research rounds. My name is Zoe Sheets, and I'm a disabled fourth-year medical student at the University of Illinois at Chicago. I'm a member of the Meeks Research Lab, as well as the advisory committee for the Docs with Disabilities Initiative. As you may know, the DREAM Consortium is a part of the Docs with Disabilities Initiative, which is focused on four areas. First, to create, mentor, and grow a robust community of scholars focused on advancing disability inclusion research in academic medicine. Second, to highlight and promote research on disability inclusion in academic medicine. Third, to identify and address gaps in disability data in academic medicine. And finally, to connect researchers and stakeholders to promote cross-cultural collaboration. And of course, if this is your first time joining us, we invite you to check out any of our other talks on our website. It's docswithdisabilities.org. You just go under research rounds. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce to you today's speaker, Dr. Karina Pereira-Lima. Dr. Pereira-Lima is a rising star in medical education. Last year alone, she published seven articles two specific to disability and all focused on trainee well-being and mental health. She is a research fellow at the Department of Neurology at the University of Michigan, and her research interests center on the study of mental health and stress-related disorders among training and practicing physicians. She also works closely with the SIN Lab on the intern health study. In 2021, she joined the Docs with Disabilities team in an effort to investigate factors associated with better well being, as well as a better educational and practice experience among physicians and medical trainees with disabilities. And personally, I have had the privilege of working with Dr. Pereira Lima and have learned a tremendous amount from her work. She's never hesitant to support me or any other students to answer our questions, even the silly ones. And I recently had the chance to co-present with her in Nashville, and it was so clear how deeply invested she is in this work to anyone who had a chance to listen. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Pereira Lima. Thank you so much, Zoe, for this so thoughtful and amazing introduction. It has been my pleasure to work with you. I have also been learning a lot with you and also working with the whole Doctors with Disabilities Initiative and Mix Lab. Um, and it's my pleasure to be here today speaking with you uh, about this topic that I'm so passionate about, that is access to disability accommodations in medical education. And to talk about this today, uh, we will start this presentation talking about the need for a greater understanding of a disability in medicine. Then I will share with you some research, um, research findings related to outcomes that are associated with lack of access to accommodations in medical education. And as the third and final step of these presentations, we will discuss some research results about the proportion of disclosures and reason for no requests of accommodations among medical trainees and students with disabilities. So let's get started with our first point in this grand round sessions. And we have here some data that underscore the urgent need for a better understanding of disability in medicine. The Last World Health Organization report on disabilities estimated that about 1.3 billion people worldwide live with the disability. This is about one in every six people and with our population, population aging, with more and more people living with chronic health conditions, this number tends to only keep increasing. This makes people with disabilities one of the largest minority groups in the whole world. And this group is a very diverse group, not only in terms of their experience of living with a disability and the types of disability, but also in terms that the disability identity that intersects with several other identities in our society, racial identities, ethnic identities, cultural, religious, sexual, and so on. And this is very important to say because we know that ableism is closely linked to racism, sexism, homophobia, and other forms of oppression in our society. 
And when we look at this data and this large number of people with disabilities, it is very clear that there is no way that our road can access, achieve healthy care equity without meeting the needs of people with disabilities. Yet, uh, the last global report on healthy equity for persons with disabilities from the World Health Organization and several other studies show that people with disabilities continue to frequently experience health inequities worldwide. Uh, and when we talk about health inequities, it's important to say that those are differences in health outcomes that are avoidable, that are unfair, and that cannot be explained by the underlying uh, health condition or the impairment. Research also suggests that patients with disabilities are much more likely to be mistreated or dismissed by healthcare providers, that around the globe, disabled people keep facing inaccessible transportation and healthcare facilities, and that compared with patients with disabilities, those with disabilities are much more likely to report that their physician, uh, their physician's skills are inadequate to meet their needs. And these reports from patients are also present in physicians' reports. We have physicians in the United States, for example, we have a research showing that 59% of practicing physicians in the US are not very confident in their ability to provide the same quality of care for patients with disability. Family physicians in Canada report transportation barriers and knowledge gaps as concerns to provide care to disabled patients. In France, we have the studies showing that 64% of physicians report lack of information as a barrier to care for disabled patients. In Brazil, health professionals working in the unified healthcare system report insufficient training on disability. So if you look at all this data together, we can see a clear picture of how urgent is the need for a greater understanding of disability in medicine. And one of the ways to increase this understanding is through the greater inclusion and support of disabled physicians and trainees. And we say that based on a mounting body of research suggesting that a diverse physician workforce benefits all patients, all trainees, all physicians, and healthcare systems. And when we look at data on the representation of physicians with disabilities in medicine, we can see the, the large and very big need for a greater inclusion and support the, uh, of those professionals. While data from the graduation questionnaire from the AAMC in 2022 showed that 9.3% of US medical students report a disability, this number keeps falling as we progress the career pathways, with data from the National Survey of Physicians showing that only 3% of US physicians self-report a disability. Therefore, it's critical that we invest in mechanisms that not only include more people with disabilities in the medical workforce, but also support these medical students and those medical residents as they progress in the career pathway in medicine. And our, our research has suggested that one of these mechanisms that can support their experience in education is guaranteeing access to needed disability accommodations in medical education. Um, and now then we can move to the second part of this Grand Rounds presentation, where we are talking about out, uh, some research findings that are associated with outcomes associated with lack of access to accommodation in medical education. So before I start sharing these research findings, I'd like to briefly present the definition of program access that we use in those two studies that I will present next. Um, so here it is. Program access is defined as having access to accommodations or not needing accommodations due to an environment where access needs are already met. So if I need an accommodation and I have that accommodation, we can say I have program access. If I don't need an accommodation because I'm in an environment where my access needs are already met, we can also say that I have program access. However, if I need an accommodation, but I do not have access to that accommodation for any reason, then I can say that I'm lacking program access. So with that in mind, I will start presenting the results of this first study, and we can check the full results on this publication. 
that was published in the, the end of 2021, where we look at first year medical residents in the United States and assess their associations of program access, depressive symptoms, and medical errors in the sample of resident physicians. So a total of 1,273 uh, resident physicians participated in, in this study and replied to our questions about disabilities. Of those, 7.5% self-reported as uh, having a disability. Of those residents who self-identified as having a disability, 32% received accommodations and 53% did not need accommodations for access. Those residents were coded as residents with program access. 1% told us that their request for accommodation was denied, and 14% did not request accommodations even though they needed accommodations. Those residents were coded as residences reporting lack of program access. And here we have one of the main findings of this study. We compared the median increase in depressive symptoms from baseline that was measured before they started their residence training, two, two months before, to the end of the first residency year. And we compared three groups regarding this outcome. Residents without disabilities, disabled residents with program access, and disabled residents just lacking program access. And when we look at those findings, we can see that while residents without disabilities and disabled residents with program access did not differ in their median increase in depressive symptoms, both groups had a median increase of two points. Uh, residents with disabilities lacking program access had a significantly higher increase in depressive symptoms than residents without disabilities a 4.5% increase in the PHQ-9 from baseline to end of residency year. And after adjusting for multiple comparison, this difference between those groups was still significant. We also looked in the study on the differences in the, the frequency of reporting self-medical, self-reporting, sorry, medical errors. Here we have a similar picture. While residents without disabilities and disabled uh, residents with program access did not have significant differences in terms of the frequency of self-report of medical errors. So in residents without disabilities, 14% self-reported medical errors compared to 13% among residents uh, that were disabled and had to program access. On the group of, of disabled residents lacking program access, 43%, a much larger proportion, self-reported concerns about a medical error in the past three months. And this difference was significant in comparison to both groups of residents without disabilities and disabled residents with program access. So the results of this study suggest that lack of access to accommodation is associated not only with a higher risk for depressive symptoms in disabled residents, but also could impact their care for their patients. We also looked in a more recent publication in December uh, last year, so a little over a month ago, on the associations of disability, program access, empathy, and burnout in United States medical st students. Uh, this publication looked at second year medical students who replied to the national survey from the AAMC, the AAMC year two questionnaire, and to look in those associations between having a disability, having program access, and empathy and burnout outcomes. A total of 23,898 students replied to the disability questions in this survey, and of those, 10% self-identified as having a disability. Among those residents, 86% uh, reported program access, so they either had an accommodation or they did not need an accommodation for access, and 14% reported a lack of program access. Those included people who had their accommodation request denied, is still on the review, or who did not request accommodations when they needed accommodations. Then we follow, after looking at this, we did the first step that was comparing only residents of, with disabilities by program access. 
So we compared their outcomes of burnout and empathy. So for high exhaustion, we can see that re while residents with disability and program access, 46% of them scored high for exhaustion, 6 to 7% of residents with disabilities lacking program access scored high for exhaustion. And this difference was significant. For high disengagement, we see a similar picture. So while 38% of residents with disability and program access scored high for disengagement, 56% of those lacking program access scored high for disengagement. This difference was also significant. For low empathy, however, we could not find a significant differences between the two groups with 25% of residents with disability and program access scoring low on the empathy scale and 27% scoring low among the, the ones who had a disability and lacked program access. But then we also wanted to go one step further. Um, and this step was to look whether uh, burnout and empathy scores of students with disabilities with and without program access whether they would differ from their colleagues without disabilities once we account for several other factors that have been previously associated with those measures. So we performed a multivariable logistic regression analysis for high burnout and low empathy among the students with and without uh, disabilities accounting for the following factors. So disability status and program access socio-demographic characters, so their cohort year, sex, age, sexual orientation, race and ethnicity, personal factors, tolerance for ambiguity, linear analogous self-assessment scale, their learning environment perceptions that were measured through the medical school learning environment scale sub, uh, scale subscales. And for the multivariable uh, models for low empathy, we also accounted for their burnout outcomes. And here I will start to share some findings of those results. The full models can be found in the publication that was published as uh, uh, open access. So you can um, access that uh, whenever you want. But here are some of the findings regarding the multivariable models uh, for high exhaustion. We can see here that our reference group, so as ratio equals to one, were non-disabled residents. The disabled residents with program access are represented in the top in blue, and the ones lacking program access are represented in the bottle in yellow. Uh, both groups, they were more likely than residents without disabilities to present with indications with, of high exhaustion. However, those who had program access were significantly less likely to present high exhaustion than their colleagues lacking program access. They had significantly lower odds. For disengagement, we have some interesting findings. Uh, while disabled students lacking program access were significantly more likely than non-disabled students to present with high disengagement outcomes, students with disabilities with the program access were not significantly more likely than students without disabilities to present high disengagement. And this is particularly important if we think that this is the dimension of burnout that is mostly associated with cynical attitudes towards their studies, their professions, and also with thoughts of dropping out of medical school. So for once students with disabilities have a program access in this national sample, they are no longer more likely to present high disengagement. We also tested those associations for low empathy. And here we can see that both groups, both disabled students with program access and disabled students without program access, they were less likely than students without disabilities to present low empathy. This is aligned with the studies for on patients' perceptions. And those studies observed that both disabled and non-disabled patients perceive physicians with disabilities as more empathic. And it also points to the potential of disabled students to contribute to a more empathic workforce, improving them patient care. And now we can move to the third and the final part of our presentations after we have like those results showing that 
um, program access seems to have a, a large impact on both the well-being of medical trainees and also the well-being of patients that they care. We can see some results on the proportion of disclosure of a disability among medical students and trainees and their reasons for not requesting accommodation. The first study that I would like to share with you is the study that was published in JAMA last year on the assessment of accommodation requested by, reported by a national sample of USMG students by category of disability. Uh, these students were also students who replied to the AAMC Y2Q survey. And those here in the study, we included the student two, uh, 2,140 students with disabilities who reported disabilities within a single category of disabilities since we were interested in looking at the differences between categories. Among those students with disabilities, 36% did not need accommodations and 64% needed accommodations. And then we look at among those students who needed accommodations, how many requested accommodations? And we saw that among those students who needed accommodations, 19%, so approximately one in every five students did not request accommodations. Given the outcomes that we know are, are associated with lack of access of accommodations when needed, it's very important that the schools, um, that they invest in policies to encourage and facilitate accommodation requests among those students with disabilities. And I know that when I present those data, all of us have in our heads like reasons why this happens, why so many students with disabilities who need accommodations do not request accommodation. Um, and I also will present by the end of this presentation some preliminary findings that we have on this topic. Um, but here, uh, before that, I would also like to talk to you about the differences that we found between the categories. So we look at the three categories of, oh, sorry, of a disability. The first one was chronic health, and this included uh, disabilities like cancer, diabetes, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, among others, cognitive disabilities, which included ADHD, learning disabilities, psychological disabilities, mental health and neuropsychiatric disorders, and motor or sensory disability that included mobility, deaf or hard of hearing, and visual disabilities. When we look at that, the proportion of uh, students who did not request accommodation when needed, we can see that uh, the proportion, oh, no, no, why my mouse is, I'm sorry about this. Um, so the proportion of students who had a cognitive disabilities, 21% of them did not request accommodations when needed, and this was significantly higher than the proportion of students with chronic health disabilities, 15%, or the proportion of students with motor or sensory disability, 9%, uh, the proportion of students who did not request accommodations when needed. So this calls our attention that this may be a particular group where we needed to focus our efforts also like in encouraging those, um, th those requests for accommodations. And up to this point, even though we all had our hypothesis and we discussed in our hypothesis on the reasons that could be behind of this high level of non-requests for um, accommodations in medical education, uh, we did not have data yet up until that point to, to say like to say anything about those reasons. And we did see that like in medical students, one in five do not request accommodations. Uh, but now for the first time, we conducted a, a research on resident physicians that were participated in the intern health study. Um, on their reasons for not disclosing disability and not requesting accommodations when needed. Those results are not yet published, and I will uh, talk to you about some of the preliminary results in this study. So among those residents, we had a sample of 173, a weighted sample of 173 residents with disabilities who participated in the survey in 2021. And we found that among those residents, 
51% of those who needed accommodations did not request them. So while in medical students, we had a one in every five, here we have during residency, more than half of the residents who needed accommodations for access did not request accommodations. And then we had questions regarding what are your reasons for not requesting accommodations, why you don't have accommodate, why accommodations were not provided to you. And here are the top two reasons that were cited by those residents with disabilities. Uh, the first one um, was the lack of a clear institutional process for requesting accommodation. And that reason was cited by 23% of residents who did not request the needed accommodation. And the top reason was fear of stigma or biases. Almost like uh, practically three in every five, 58% of residents who did not request accommodation when they needed reported that they feared stigma or bias for requesting accommodations. When we look at those two top reasons, we can start to think about action points that medical schools and residency programs should adopt to encourage and support accommodation requests among the medical students. For the first one, lack of a clear institutional process, it's clear that programs should be more transparent and clearer about every step that is involved in the process of requesting a disability accommodation. This needs to be in their handbooks, stated on their institution website, on their orientation lectures, their orientation materials, and so on. It needs to be transparent and talk about. Uh, but more than that, more than being transparent and clear, those programs need to be, this, the systems for disability disclosure, they need to be aligned with best practices in disability disclosure. This is very important. We have a 2020 research done by the Docs with Disabilities Lab that found that most US programs lacked key elements identified as best practice for disability disclosure in the AAMC regulation. It is very important, for example, uh, that these programs in schools hire specialized disability personnel to run the process of accommodation requests and provision of accommodations in both the medical schools and residency programs. From reports from several disabled medical students and residents, it's known that like it can be very discouraging for trainees when they go through the whole process of requesting accommodations to disclosure their disabilities to find out in the end of the system a person who that that is a person who is involved with that process but lacks knowledge about their needs lacks knowledge about dis uh, disability accommodations in the context of medical education and training lacks knowledge about disability law and so on so it's very important that these people have and this team has people with experience and that is specialized in disability accommodations in medical education it is also extremely important when we study barriers for requests that the professionals who are responsible for disability accommodations in these programs are not involved in the student's assessment, education, and progression. Trainees fear stigma or bias uh, in such a large percentage because unfortunately, stigma towards disability is still a reality in our society and is still a reality in medicine. So residency programs need to be active in communicating an environment that supports psychological safety and where lived experiences of disabilities are valued as an important form of diversity that enriches patient care. Uh, when we see all that data on the lack of representations of physicians of disabilities, on the reports of patients with disabilities that physicians and other healthcare professionals do not have the skills that meet their needs, um, of physicians saying that they lack knowledge for accommodation, physician uh, accommodation, sorry, not accommodation, about uh, like knowledge about disability and how to care for people with disabilities and the specificity of needs. We can see how important is a better inclusion of those professionals in medical educations. This greater inclusion can 
of disabled trainees can challenge the, the biases of disabilities and the stereotypes that are present in medicine. And this can lead to positive impacts on patient care and the much, much needed greater understanding of disability in medicine. So with conclusion, when we reveal this data about the low representation of people with disability in medicine and the high um, rates of health inequities that are experienced for, from patients with disabilities accessing healthcare worldwide, when you look at data on how program access is associated with not only an increased well-being in disabled trainees, but also with better patient, like more positive patient care outcomes. And however, several residents and several medical students do not access accommodations due to barriers that are related to stigma and lack of a clear policy to request accommodations. We have a clear picture that programs should carry out uh, systematic efforts to increase access to accommodations among the disabled medical trainees. And when I say systematic access, sorry, systematic efforts, I'm talking about clear processes, clear policies that are followed and that are measured. Um, so, and that clear have the aim of combating like this nebulous uh, or uh, process sometimes that in trainees encounter in institutions and also like to combat the stigma against disabilities in medical education and training. Uh, with that, I would also like to acknowledge my amazing and brilliant colleagues from the Docs with Disabilities Initiative and Lab, from the Internal Health Study, from the AMC. The pictures here are from the people who co-authored those publications that we discussed today and presented today. And it has been an amazing experience to learning. Uh, and work with all of them. And thank you all very much for being here today. And I'd be glad to take your questions and discuss those findings with you.